uh, Paul's uh, first epistle that he wrote, and it's, uh, I think, uh, perhaps one of the greatest one. It's one of the greatest arguments against uh, legalism. It's one of the greatest arguments against the idea that you needed to keep the law in order to be saved. And that's part of what the text is about here today, as Paul is uh, talking about our justification. Our justification means they are getting our standing before God, and that's directly related to our salvation, and uh, pointing out that, uh, that we're justified by faith, uh, not by obedience to the law. And uh, those are two separate things, aren't they? And uh, we, uh, we believe it's important to understand that uh, salvation is by faith and faith alone, and faith alone. Uh, Dick had asked me if, um, um, if we had, um, uh, are you out, out of them? Have everybody got one? Yeah. All right. I'm going to look at Dick. He's kind of muddling around here. He asked me if I'd stopped and, uh, and, uh, and uh, picked up one of the, did you ask me, he said there's one more on there. Did you, is that what you said? Skunk on the road. And I told him, I said, that wasn't one more. That was a parting of the ways, if we know what I mean. The, uh, <laughs> thank you, that ought to gross you out. And I think about that when you go to bed tonight. But uh, uh, it's, it's seldom we see skunks like that. And when I see uh, uh, Liz drives out to the base out there, and she's always talking about possums and bobcats and, and just all kinds of critters that she sees out there. And uh, I think they they are attracted to her. But uh, could you... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the flamingos drag him in. Uh, but we're looking at Paul, uh, the Pauline epistle, the just shall live by faith, and we're, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, Paul's uh, confusion, his frustration. I should use that word frustration, chapter 3, with the believers in Galatia. Remember now, this is written to Galatians. Now, it's not, that doesn't imply there's one church in Galatia. There's probably several churches in Galatia. So, uh, so we could, uh, this letter is to the, churches in Galatia that's an that's an area that's a region and Paul uh, this is where Paul's first ministry really really took off after salvation he got going and uh, uh, that's where he went with his companions to that area around that area of Galatia and I believe they started several churches now I I I, uh, I, I believe that upholds to with the church history and that's uh, that's that's been taught and told so as he's writing here he's writing and one of the problems that came into the church in Galatia uh, came from Jerusalem, and we've talked about that earlier. That that there were individuals in, Jer in Jerusalem that uh, that uh, were uh, Jews that were saved that were uh, uh, trying to add the law to salvation and uh, justification, uh, and uh, part of which was that uh, uh, the subject of circumcision. Uh, whether or not uh, the the Gentile believers needed to be circumcised or not, and uh, uh, and it was a division that actually divided not just uh, uh, the churches in Galatia, it divided the church in Jerusalem. They had to have a big meeting about it. They had a big long discussion about it, and uh, they came to the right conclusion that uh, circumcision has nothing to do with salvation, and uh, it's not a it's not a Jewish thing. That was something that was uh, that uh, was aligned or identified with a Jew. And someone said, well, did the Jews that got saved, did they need to be circumcised? And I, and I honestly, uh, that's a different uh, question that I have not really had a good, uh, they certainly didn't have to get circumcised to get saved, but whether or not they should have been circumcised as being a Jew, uh, that's up for discussion, isn't it? And uh, if you want to have a good discussion about that, you can talk to Pastor Burroughs afterwards. He can, he can fill you up. <laughs> And you know what his conclusion is? I probably like mine. I think that we'll start it that way, <laughs> because uh, some of those things we're not too clear on. But certainly that was part of being a Jew. That was part of Judaism was uh, circumcision, and the law was so very important. And those two subjects, circumcision and the law, uh, uh, became part of the problems in the early church. Uh, some of the uh, uh, believers, the Jewish believers that were saved. Uh, they started reverting to the law, just reminding how important the law is. Now, we know that the law of God is good. The Bible says the law is good. But it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's the given to convict of sin, uh, showing, we need a, showing us we need a Savior. But, uh, and and it, re, it restrains sin. That's the nice part about the law. It does restrain sin. Anybody that thinks that laws don't restrain sin, you're wrong. 
If there wasn't a speed limit out there, they'd be driving a lot faster. There wasn't a law. Uh, there's certain individuals here that would be driving carelessly. I'm not going to point any of you out here. But, but the fact of the matter, the law, for those reasons, are, laws are important. But when it comes to the subject of our salvation, we're saved by faith in Christ's finished work. And his finished work is not just on the cross. It's his death, burial, and his resurrection. You have to have all three parts of that. He, has, he died for our sins. He was buried. And then he rose again. And so that redemptive work means that the price had to be paid. He had to die. And he had to be buried. He had to carry as our sin buried. He had to carry our sins where he carry if He took our sins to the grave. And he rose victorious over sins. Our sins were, uh, he was buried, carried no sins of his own. He carried our sins to the grave. And as his sins are washed away, the, he rose victorious. And that's a picture. When we get baptized, we're picturing our salvation, aren't we? We're getting baptized in the name of Jesus. As he was baptized for us, now we're identifying with his baptism. We are being baptized for what he did through his death, burial, and resurrection. And I, by the way, there's no... There's no, uh, 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 baptism doesn't save, whether it's a Baptist baptism or a, uh, any kind of baptism, ba but it pictures what Christ did for us on Calvary. So Paul's frustration now with the believers, and so he asked them a question. He said, oh foolish, Galatians, verse 1, chapter 3, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently been set forth and crucified among you. So, so the question is, is who's telling you this? Who's telling you this? And I, I, uh, I, it, it, uh, it's, it's the belief that I have, and it seems to point out here that part of that belief came from Judaizers from Jerusalem that it came in and were impacting the church. There's a story that's related to this, this story we talked about on another occasion about how uh, Peter had been with them. We saw that earlier in this book. Uh, and uh, eating and then some people from Jerusalem showed up and he separated himself was eating apart and and uh, well those so there had been Jews from Jerusalem in that church that were rejoicing in the salvation of the Jews but hadn't separated himself Paul got carried away in so much that he separated and even Barnabas we saw that earlier chapter here uh, who was Paul's companion separated as if to say the Jews were sitting over here. The Gentile Christians were sitting over here. By the way, let me just say that different. The Jewish Christians were say, sitting over here, and the Gentile Christians started sitting over here. And there was a beginning of a separation. And uh, uh, Paul's frustration with the believers of Galatia, because there were some there that, uh, uh, that were confusing the gospel. So he, he says, Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And uh, now... Uh, they needed to remember the truth that, well, that they once clearly saw. So uh, uh, they, were bewit they were bewitched from obeying the truth before. And what was the truth before? Look at verse 1. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ had evidently set before you crucified among you. In other words, the gospel. You heard the gospel. And who's bewitched you now to take you away from that gospel by which you were saved? It would be like uh, me dealing with a person, seeing that person saved, then somebody else coming and saying, well, you know, uh, if you're really going to be saved, you need to, you, you need to do this too. And all of a sudden you start thinking, wait a minute, maybe, maybe I'm not even saved. And, and, and then they, you get them to start doing things that quite frankly, are, uh, they're t you're telling them, you've got to do this too. You have to add something to the work of Jesus Christ on Calvary through his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's, that's, it. that's, uh, Anathema. That's, that's not true. And so we ask that question. Who has fooled you? Who has tricked you? And uh, I believe it pictures the idea that, that there were some Judaizers uh, that it came in were trying to convert them to Judaism and not to Christianity. That was the battle in the early church. That was the battle in the early church. And uh, 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 so he asked that question. You saw Jesus uh, was and is the Christ. You saw that Jesus was crucified for you. Now, that's the heart of the gospel. If I'm dealing with you, if you're here today and you're not saved, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you get saved, you're going to carry your sins. And when you die, because you're a sinner, you're going to this place called hell. Because there has to be a payment for your sin. And there's only one person that can pay that, can pay that payment. 
It has to be someone that's sinless. It has to be Jesus Christ, for he was sinless. And he was crucified for our sins, and he was buried, carried our sins forward, and he rose again victorious. And his resurrection is proof that God the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's all, that's all part of the gospel. And so who hath bewitched you that you and learn of you? Uh, look at verse 2. This I would learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of the faith. Now, in the early church, now this is important because you won't see this, and I'll tell you something. I didn't see this at first. I didn't think about it. I saw it, but I didn't think about it. One of the, one of the things that took place in the early church were, that was this thing called the sign gifts of the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes when people were saved, there were some sign gifts that took place, including the speaking in tongues, other languages, including some of the other sign gifts that are mentioned in Scripture. And so when, the, when they were saved, uh, at times, and I'm not saying they all did, but I think some of them uh, had uh, the gift of the Spirit in such a special way. Maybe it was just the joy overflowing. Certainly that takes place. How many of you had joy overflowing when you got saved? Amen. Many people, joy unspeakable, full of glory, filled with, with joy. That's better than some, some uh, uh, outward sign gift. It's an inward sign gift. Who hath bewitched you should not obey the truth. When you receive the Spirit, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law. Did you get that from keeping the law? Did you have that joy? Did you get some special working in you? Some extra joy in you because you obeyed a commandment? You didn't uh, 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 kill somebody, you didn't murder somebody. Uh, some of the basics of the law, you didn't bear false witness. Does that result in some, uh, yippee, yippee, I, I, I kept the law. Uh, was there any uh, unction, there was there any real working of joy in you of the Holy Ghost? No. You see, keeping the law, you know, I drive into town, I keep the speed limit all the way home. I, I get home and say, honey, honey, I, I didn't speed once. Yippee. By the way, that's how I talk to my daughter Jenny, and she still responds to that. If I call her on the phone, she's on the phone, and I say that on the other side, uh, she throws her hands up in the air. She, she, uh, she responds to my yippies. But uh, the, the point being is that, uh, is that when, when a person gets saved and that joy of salvation comes upon you, uh, it's not doesn't come upon you because of the law. It comes upon you because you heard the word, you received Christ, and now the Holy Spirit is producing joy in your heart. Joy in your heart. It does something, you go home from church and God speaks to you. And you have a word of prayer afterwards. You're thanking the Lord God, you spoke to me today. Have that happen? I had several people this morning say they really got a blessing from this morning's message. And they said it to me like they, they, just, they just got. Now they, that joy came from, not me, that, that joy came from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit still produces joy in the lives of the believers. Uh, young people, listen to me. There's a reason why uh, uh, your parents and other people come to church and they leave smiling. It's because the Holy Spirit is giving them a blessing. It's giving them joy. And they find joy in Jesus. They find, wow, that was wonderful. Thank you for speaking to me, Lord. They find joy in Jesus and having a relationship. They, they, they don't come home and say, boy, I didn't speed once on the way home. I didn't once yell at somebody. I didn't once hit somebody. They don't find joy in obedience. They find joy, and that joy comes from the Holy Spirit. He said, learn this of you. Uh, did you receive the, uh, the Spirit uh, uh, that would produce joy in you by works of the Lord, by the hearing of the faith? And that's salvation uh, all by itself in verse number two. You know, we don't get saved by hearing what we shouldn't do we get saved by realizing what Jesus did. He died for our sins. He was buried, that he rose again. And, and it's not by the works of the law. It's by the hearing of faith. And uh, that's why Christians and people say, I don't understand when these crazy Baptists, they go to church and they go to church and they go to church and they go to all these things. Why are you going? And they have no idea because they have no idea what joy the Holy Spirit puts in your heart when you hear the word of God and get around other Christians and you find joy ministering to one another. There's joy. And by the way, listen to careful on this. When the church, a church, any church, 
Baptist church or some other church of other, but a gospel preaching church, a church that's preaching the truth. When something happens to that church and the joy of the Holy Spirit dis disappears, that church is going to be doomed. That church is going to be doomed. It's going to go downhill. And uh, and some people that grew up in a in a Baptist church that's so that's so rigid, where nobody dares smiles and nobody better smiles, you know, they've got a certain older group there. But when that older group dies out, the older the church dies out. Because people need joy. They need the joy of the Holy Spirit. They need to sense God working. And the Spirit working in their life and through the Word of God. So he asked them, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? And the answer is no. Yeah, did you receive the Spirit by hearing of the faith? And the answer is yes. And so then he asked them again, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? Look at verse 3. Have it begun in the Spirit... I now made perfect by the flesh. Now, first, he said in verse 2, by the law, now he talks about the flesh. So, you begun in the Spirit, and in the Spirit, uh, uh, are you going to take the law over the Spirit? Well, now it's talking about, are you made perfect by the flesh? By the flesh. And some say, if you begun in the Spirit, how are you made perfect by the flesh? Now, what does that mean? Now we're not talking about obedience here. But we're talking about fleshly things. Fleshly things. This is a little harder to preach on, honestly. It's a little harder to preach on because I'm liable to step on toes all over the place here. Because there are churches that have departed from the gospel and they've substituted fleshly worship. You say, what do you mean by fleshly worship? Worship that centers and is appealing to the flesh, not necessarily to the spirit. Now, uh, I, 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 I told you I'm probably going to offend you, but, but I will anyway. Churches that center on a set of drums playing and, and, a, and a beat taking place and people dancing on one side, those things appeal to the flesh. They don't appeal to the spirit. They're fleshly in nature. And, and uh, we know that some churches are, uh, and there are some preachers that appeal to the flesh. Now, obviously, you've been here long enough to, already to know that, that, I, that I joke around a little bit. Honestly, some people would be offended by the amount of joking around I do. I've already offended Dick. <laughs> Sorry, Dick. He's my cousin, so I could do that to him. <laughs> it's in the family. He's stuck with me. But, uh, but... They, they don't like any levity at all. Now, I, 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 I know even Pastor Burroughs, I know Pastor Burroughs agrees with no levity at all, no fun at all. It's no fun to preach. Isn't that right, brother? That's right. And without a little joy, without a little lightness, I think that, I think, uh, uh, let, me, let me put that, if, if you're eating oatmeal, it goes down with a little bit of sugar on it. And, and, and so if we're going to feed him some oatmeal, we want to spread a little sugar with it too. And, and I think that uh, there are many preachers that do that. But the thought that, again, that we're coming back to this, uh, the flesh, having begun in the spirit, are you going to be made perfect by the flesh? Uh, and I'm not picking on any denomination here. Baptist, I'm not picking on any, I'm really not at all. But uh, there are churches that preach a light gospel but their services are very fleshly in nature. Uh, whether it's by music, whether it's by some of those things that take place where it's, uh, uh, where, let me, uh, I could use an illustration about uh, using more stories in life than they use the Word of God. Little emphasis on Scripture. Little emphasis on Cal Calvary. Little el emphasis on Jesus. And a whole lot of emphasis on joy, peace, and uh, I mean the kind of uh, uh, humorous type stuff that, uh, and uh, uh, I hope we have balance here. Pray that our church will have balance. We don't want to be stuck in the mud and never smile. We don't want to be unhappy, but we don't want to be uh, frivolous either. We don't want to be so, so silly that nothing matters. We don't want to have that either. And Paul is addressing the, he's really focusing on the other side, but he's mentioning this again. Our perfection doesn't come by the law. It doesn't come by the flesh. And now he goes on in verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain, 
if it be yet in vain. So in other words, uh, the suffering that a person goes through when they get saved and the, the persecution they've gone through, especially in Galatia, the persecution that they endured because they made professions of faith and got saved and they begin this work of, of growing in Christ. And, and uh, what a, wouldn't it be a shame to uh, see a young Christian, a young Christian that's beginning their Christian walk, to have somebody that's real legalistic to come in and take them away and take away and ultimately their joy too because they're under the flesh. The spirit cannot work under the, under the law. The spirit works by the spirit. The spirit doesn't work by just good story. The spirit works through the very spirit of God. So it's got to have a spiritual basis to it, doesn't it? So when, when you understand what he's saying here, or the way I read it anyway, it certainly says this about this. Uh, again, verse uh, three, uh, the second part of verse number, or verse three and then uh, four and five. Have you suffered so many things in vain? Yet yeah, it be in vain. He therefore that ministered to you in the spirit worketh miracles among you. Doth he do it by works of the law, by the hearing of the faith? Now we're coming back to what I was talking about before. The sign gifts in the early church were real. The sign gifts in the early church were real. Uh, the signs gifts of healing, the sign gifts uh, in the early church were given. And I believe when you study the book of Galatians, understanding it was one of the very first books that was written at the very beginning of the church, I believe the sign gifts were much more uh, uh, evident. And, and, and so I believe that's why this is talking about here. There's a, a thing of working miracles. You said, well, preacher, do you think God works miracles today? Oh, yeah, I do. I've seen a soul set free. I've, I've seen people get saved. Uh, the foundation of the church, I think, was a miracle. We've had provisions uh, for, for our personal needs that, that uh, quite frankly, were miraculous in the way that they came in. We've had amazing things take place. It's hard to talk to people in the ministry that, that will not tell you about some of the things they faced and, and they know they know that God did something or they wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have survived or something terrible would have happened or an accident would have happened. Something, there, there's things there that have taken place. I'm not denying that those things take place. But when you're talking about miracles, look what he says there, and uh, that minister, uh, uh, how does he, that minister, do among miracles among you? There's cer certain implication there. He's talking about somebody that's a teacher in the church that has the power to do miracles. Is he, and does he, uh, in the, that minister you, do miracles among you? How does he do it uh, in the spirit? Does he work with this spiritual head by the law, by the hearing of the faith? So in other words, when these miracles take place, these miracles, and, and I, I, I could tell you something. I could remember a, a young fellow that I had led to the Lord. And uh, he made a profession of salvation, and he was growing in his faith. And uh, he got right back into the world, and it was drugs. He got right back into drugs. And he struggled, struggled, struggled. And uh, he did some really dumb stuff and, and uh, uh, managed to get a young girl pregnant, was living with her, and had a child. And, and, and then he called me up, and yeah, I got to get right. And I went over and prayed with him, and he wept, and he prayed, and he got right with the Lord. And he started coming for, to a church a little bit, and he got his life changed, got it back on track went right back into sin. Pretty soon he got back into sin and suddenly now he's, something's taking place physically. He's got a tumor in the brain. He's got a tumor in the brain and uh, they've given him a death sentence. He's 18 years old. And they've given him a death sentence and he's going to die. And he called me up and he was broken hearted over it and uh, is uh, struggling with it. And he, he said, I said, well, I said, I will pray. I will pray that God will heal you. I said, I don't know if he will or not. I will pray that God will heal you. And, uh, and you know, I prayed over him. I, I, I laid hands on him and I prayed over him. I don't want to go Pentecostal on here. God's still healing today. You don't have to go to a Pentecostal church and have God heal. I prayed over him. And, uh, and boy, it was one of those days where you really felt like God was doing something. I really did. And he called me two weeks later and he said, the doctor said it's gone. The doctor said that the, the cancer's gone. It was gone. And uh, I said, are you sure? And he said, well, that's what the doctor says. Nothing is showing up. I've had two MRIs and nothing, nothing's showing up. That, uh, well, me being a, a cautious 
believer and not and uh, not trusting things and being very careful. I want to be careful because I know God could do that. I didn't do anything. God does it if He did it. And uh, and for six months, I got together and talked to him about different times. I came to church a few times, and we were seeing spiritual growth. And it was six months went by, he went right back into drugs. Went right back into drugs. Three months back into drugs, he called me up. Wanted to talk to me. The doctor said the cancer is back. They give me a death sentence. 19 years old. I said to him, I said, I said, oh. He said to me, he looked me right square in the eye. He says, it's my fault. I went back into sin. He wasn't mad at God. <laughs> we, we prayed. We did all those things that you do. And we prayed. And I, I, uh, I prayed over him again. God, in his grace, would heal him again to, to do it. But God didn't. He grew steadily worse, steadily, steadily worse, steadily worse, steadily worse. And finally, I got a phone call. They said, he's, he's going to die. They wanted me to come over. So I went over, and I can't remember what night it was. It seemed like it was a Saturday night or something. I went over, and uh, the whole family was there. His, his wife or his girlfriend was there, and, and his friends were there. So there was probably... 15 people in the room there and he was in bed he was in bed in the other room and he was in kind of a uh, in a, in a curled in a fetal position he was dying couldn't talk anymore couldn't talk anymore and uh, his breathing was heavy and she said I think it's I think it's going to be near she said would you pray pray over him, pray over him. I went in and I I laid my hands on him. I prayed for this young man. I'm not going to mention his name. But I prayed over this man. I laid the hands on this guy. He's 19 years old, just a kid. And I said, Lord, and I, I, went, I rattled through. I said, you know, this, this young man is saved. Lord, he's yours. He's done some dumb things. He's got himself back in a sin. You've chosen to let him get sick again. And now it's time that I believe you're going to take him. And I prayed a prayer, and I said, Lord, would you please take him now? He was gone. I said, I said now, and I said, in Jesus' name, take him now. I said that, amen, and amen, he was gone. He died so suddenly, his wife freaked out. She was screaming, she was screaming. The people were shipped, looking about, looking about. And you know, I left with some peace because I know where he's at. Because he's in heaven. <laughs> God, God took him. You know, sometimes when there are say people that die that have made a lot of their own problems and they've chosen to go back into sin. But if they genuinely got saved, once saved, always saved. God took him home. I never forgot that day. It uh, it uh, changed me. It changed me knowing that uh, uh, that our God saves and once saved, always saved. But our God is a God of great power. Our God is a God of great power. A pastor can pray with a man and. And they can ask to be saved, and I can pray with them, and I can believe God's got the power to save them. And, and friend, is it any bigger miracle to think that God has the power to take them as well? It's no bigger miracle. We've got a God that's great. And uh, that young man is with the Lord today. And uh, listen, this young man, God had done some miracles among this young man had done some miracles, but those miracles didn't save him. He was saved before then. He was saved by faith. And Paul is talking to these believers, understand, understanding this, is that the spirit that minister, does the spirit minister us by the, by the law of God in verse 5? Therefore he that ministereth you in the spirit, does he worketh miracles by, that he doeth works of the law or by the hearing of the faith? No, uh, our, our God works by the spirit, not, not because we... Uh, uh, 
uh, the works of the law or the hearing of the faith, our God by his spirit works in us. And the spirit ministers to us. And the spirit ministers to us. And by the way, the spirit is always ministering to us. And so Paul's instruction now, uh, and now he's going to go from that, those experiences, those things, and now he's going to talk about Abraham. Look at verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now there's a, part, there's a reason why he's dealing with Abraham. And some of you know what it is. I know Pastor Burroughs does. Abraham predated the law. And he's showing now that God's ministry was not by the law, it's by the Spirit. And just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, when we get saved, we don't get saved because suddenly we start obeying the Bible and doing the, doing the Ten Commandments. We get saved because we believe in the one who died for us on Calvary that paid the price of our sin. Our obedience doesn't save us. Uh, Christ saves us by his dying for our sins. By his dying for our sins on Calvary. It's the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that saves. And as he died and was buried, then he rose. And so Abraham believed God. Now, did Jesus, did Abraham know all about Jesus coming? And No, but he believed that God saves. And God saves. Now, we've got a better understanding of the coming of Messiah than Abraham did in his day. Uh, he didn't have that name Jesus like, like we have. But he did know God saves, which is Jesus. <laughs> That's the name. That's what literally what it means. Galatians 3, verse 7 and 8. Know ye therefore they which are of the faith, and the same are the children of Abraham. For the scripture foreseeing God would justify the heathen through faith, preached therefore the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee all nations shall be blessed. All nations are speaking of the heathen as well. So in Galatians 3, verse 7 and 8, he's, uh, he's, just re, uh, in, uh, he's just explaining further that as Abraham believed God, it was counted to him for righteous. That's his personal salvation. That know ye therefore that they which are of the faith, that's the saved, the same are children of Abraham as well, in a sense. Just like uh, Abraham, uh, they got saved, they in a sense become saved because they followed Abraham's example in their salvation. For seeing God would justify the heathen through faith, just as God justified a Abraham through faith, we're saved by faith. Now, the, the point I want to stress on this, Abraham uh, predated the law. In a sense, uh, in many ways, we would say the, the much of Judaism, the religion of the Jews, Abraham predated that. It had its start, some of that stuff started after him, but quite frankly, the point that the, that the Apostle Paul is making is, a, is that is, a, is salvation by faith. Romans chapter 4 speaks about this. I'm going to read a passage. Uh, listen carefully. For if we say that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found. And uh, now if you're, as I'm reading Abraham or Romans 4, uh, look in your Bibles at Galatians chapter 3, verses 6, 7, and 8. And see if there's not a direct tie between the two. What should we say then? This is uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 1. For if we say that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh had found, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteous. Now to him that worketh uh, uh, is not a reward, but uh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted uh, for righteousness. Do you, under, you hear what I'm saying there? In other words, we can't earn our salvation. As salvation comes by, uh, not by works, but by our faith. As verse 6, even as, uh, in uh, Romans 6, uh, 4, verse 6, even as David also described the blessed man whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. It cometh then this blessedness uh, then upon the circumcision only, that's the Jews, or upon the uncircumcision also. For he saith that faith is reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, how much it reckoned. 
uh, when he was in the circumcision or uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, as of that time, when, when, when Abraham was justified by faith, he, uh, the practice of circumcision had not begun. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what the Paul uh, is saying here. Was it reckoned to him when he, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. When God's word declared that Abraham was justified by faith, he hadn't been circumcised yet. He hadn't practiced circumcision yet. Uh, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of faith, which he had not yet being circumcised, that it might be the father to them that believe, and not and though they be not circumcised, that the righteous might be imputed to them also. That's us. Uh, we're, we're not Jews. We weren't circumcised according to the Jewish faith. I, I, men here might have been circumcised, but it wasn't a, a religious ritual by, uh, done by a priest. It wasn't the circ biblical circumcision. It's a, it was a, it's a medical procedure that uh, takes place on most, most men today. And Abraham had that, uh, he received, was justified by faith before, circum before he was even circumcised. And that's why. So that he might, as he says there uh, in verse uh, 12, the father of circumcision to them who are not circumcised, only but those who walk by faith of our, of our father Abraham, which had yet being uncircumcised for the promise that he should be made heir of the world was not to Abraham, but to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith, for if they which are the law heirs, faith is void and made the promise of none effect. And I say all that, and you can read the rest of that down through there, so you understand now, when you read Galatians 3, verses 7 and 8, what you're really talking about is Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Paul recites and goes through that whole long story uh, there, so you get a better understanding of Abraham, and a better understanding that faith is by faith, uh, 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 salvation is by faith and faith alone, and it's given to the non-Jews. And so he's our father too, just like he was the father of Judaism. He's the father of Christianity, in a sense. He's a, he could be listed like that. The verse sixteen of that text, therefore, it is not is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed that not only those which are of the law, but also those which by faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. That's uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. So if you're talking to a Jew and they would say, here, Abraham is our father and you're saved, you could say, he's my father too. Let me show you scripture. And take him to Romans chapter 4 and read verse 16 to him. and says, see, that's, that's me. He's my father too. All they which be of faith are then blessed with faithful Abraham. Galatians 3.9. So then they which be of faith are blessed with Father Abraham. He is not just our father. The same blessing he has is the same blessing we have. He's in heaven. That's where we'll be if we've been saved by faith. For salvation is by faith and not of the law. Galatians 3 verse 10 11. For as many are the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written... Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for it's evident that just shall live by faith. Now what's that mean? That means that if our faith, if our, if our salvation is based upon our keeping the law, that means we cannot break any law at any time. Because if we break the law at all at any time, then we're guilty of all the law and we lose our salvation. Now, if that was true, if that was true, there's not a saved person here. There's not a saved person here because, because everyone here has sinned since they've been saved. And, and if you haven't been saved, you're, you, you've got sin too. We're not, we're not we, it doesn't work that way. And so it's by grace that we're saved. It's by grace we're saved. And curse for all those who do not do all the words of the law. And uh, look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, uh, 27, 26. Cursed be he that confirm, cur confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people said, Amen. Now, in other words, when we I have to obey the law or we lose our salvation, we have to do every single word. We cannot 
not do any word, every word, every word. And for the law is not a faith, and the man that doeth them shall live by them. Galatians 3, verse 12. So the law has no reference, or it's, it's not, has nothing to do with, with the law. If you're driving in town tonight, and you're going back, and you're going 70 miles an hour, and, you, and the policeman stops you and says, uh, um, I'm giving you a ticket, you're going 70, and you say, y you know, I don't really believe that I was going 70. And, uh, and uh, he said, oh, that's too bad. I don't really believe I'm giving you this ticket, but I am anyway. The law is hard. The law, the law, there's no mercy in the law. All the law is given is to, is to, is to uh, uh, punish you. That's what the law is for. It's not to vindicate you. It's to condemn you. And the law that we're talking about here is the law that ends up resulting in salvation, in uh, the curse. Now, so he redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Verse 13. Cursed is everyone that's hung on a tree. Look at Galatians 3, verse 13. This reminds us of why Jesus died on Calvary. Here, listen carefully. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeem us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That is why Jesus was hung on the cross. Jesus was hung on the cross, and he died on the cross, because he was bearing our curse. Because our sin uh, brings a curse upon us. The curse of sin is death. That's the curse of sin. So when Jesus died, he bore our curse when he was hung on a cross, suspended above the earth and heaven above. He's suspended and he dies for all of us. He took our curse. All our law breaking fell upon him. And our curse fell upon him. That's really something to think about when you think about it. Wonderful thing what the Lord did for us. And why? Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So all of that took place, that we might receive the blessings through Jesus and the promise of the Spirit. So listen, my salvation rests on all this stuff. Your salvation rests on all this and it just, it's just the great plan of salvation that God has for it. It's the blessing of Abraham that God gave to Abraham now comes upon us. Because, because uh, yeah, through Jesus Christ, he hung on the cross and died for us. And so he is the fulfillment of that covenant. And so he says in verse 15, Brethren, I speak therefore the manner of men, uh, though it be uh, but a man's covenant, yet if be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth to it. Now if Abraham and his seed were promises made, he say that to his seeds, but unto many, but as unto one, and to thy seed, meaning Jesus. So he says this, the covenant was confirmed that no man can add to, no man could take, care, take away from. The covenant was fulfilled by one seed, and that one seed in verse 16 was Jesus Christ, and the covenant then was confirmed by God in Christ, verse 17, that was confirmed before God in Christ by the law which 430 years after could not disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. I went a little crazy when I was studying this. I'll tell you what, these things that might be coming out kind of clear for you, but uh, it gets a little uh, as you're going through this. But you can see here what it's saying. We, it was all fulfilled by Jesus, the fulfillment. And 40, 430 years later, by the seed of Jesus Christ, the thing that God had said to Abraham 430 years came to fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. And so we ask ourselves then, if the law doesn't apply to us, if the law is there, why was it given? Well, its work was temporary. The law was added because of transgression, verse 19. The law was given because men were, were, were going deep into sin and God didn't want people to go deep into sin. I might say it like this, uh, listen to me. Your mom, your dad, you, they're your mom and your dad, when you were a kid, wanted your kid, they want, you wanted your kids to do right, to do right, to get a blessing. And, uh, and uh, uh, so they gave you rules. They gave you a law to live by because they know if they didn't give you anything, you might kill somebody else as well as yourself. The law was given to restrain you, to keep you from doing something really stupid. 
a lot of parents are busy trying to keep their kids from doing something stupid, at least long enough till their brain gets uh, caught up to where their actions are to keep them from doing something stupid and killing themselves. And the law was given to, to restrain sin, but it was not given to save. And the blessings then come upon, through Christ, upon one seed, 430, and, and uh, uh, it cannot be disannulled. The promises cannot be of none effect. Look at verse 16 and 17. Now Abraham to his seed the promises made, he saith not to thy seed, but many, but as one, and one seed through which is Christ, meaning Jesus, and therefore confirmed by God in Christ the law, 430 years after, could not disannul, disannul and, and should make that promise of none effect. And I say this, that the covenant was confirmed before God in Christ, the law 430 years later, verse 17, verse 18, for the inheritance of the law, which is no more promise, but God gave to Abraham by promise. What's the function of the law? We saw it was temporary. It was added because of transgression in verse 19. And the law was ordained by angels at the hand of the mediator, verse 19 and 20. What serveth then the law? It was added because of the transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. It was ordained by the angel at the hand of the mediator. Now the mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. And the mediator of the law, verse 20, is God the one, I believe that's Jesus Christ. For there's one God, one mediator between God and man. First Timothy chapter two, verse five, uh, five, five gives us the answer to that. Listen carefully. First Timothy two, verse five, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That's who the mediator is. Hebrews eight, verse six. But now he hath established, a, a ordained and a, a more excellent ministry how much also is the mediator uh, of a better covenant which was established on, upon better promises. Verse 9, not according of Hebrews 8, verse 9, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant. I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Verse 13, and, in he, and he saith, a new covenant he hath made the first old, and he that decayeth and waxeth the way is ready to vanish away. Uh, Hebrews 12 verse 24 and to the mediator of Jesus Christ uh, of Jesus of the me the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh of better things than that of Abraham so we see all those things in those verses and you can look those up on your own and they confirm what I'm saying those things were set in order uh, 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 to the law by angels is a law against then the promises of God and God says, God forbid. Verse, uh, he, Galatians 3, verse 21. Is a law against the promises of God, God forbid. For there had been a given a law that could have given life, very the righteousness should have come by the law. You know, about this time in my study, my brain started going dead. I've been telling you something. My brain was, was like rattling. I'm trying to hold all these things, Abraham here and, and, and Jesus over here, and, and trying to hold the time differences here we're talking about in Abraham's day, then we're talking about 430 years later, talking about all these things. And I was ready to quit, quit studying, I'm gonna tell you. I was about ready to pitch it all in and saying, <sighs> I had another cup of coffee and thought I'd go a little bit longer. But the point being here is that Jesus Christ is, uh, uh, it says this in verse 21, and this is the one I wanna you know, focus on uh, and, I, and I'm going to have to leave here because uh, I don't want you to go crazy and walk out on me. But Galatians 3, verse 21, tells you something here about the law. This is maybe one of the greatest verses about why the law can't save. It's because God says it can't save. And the law is good. Galatians 3, 21, read these words with me as it says there. Is the law then... Uh, or is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily the righteousness should have been by the law. In other words, the law he gave us was the very best law we could possibly have. But even the very best law given by God himself couldn't save. We're not saved by keeping the law. 
We're saved by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're not saved by the law. If anybody could write a law that could maybe save, well, it would have been, this would have had to have been it. The law was that good. But even that law, that great law, and the great law that God gave, was incapable of sending anyone. And why? Because the law is spiritual. Galatians chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do allow not, that which I would, that I do, I do not, that which I hate, that I do. If I then do that which I would not, I consent to that the law is good. No, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For we know that in me and in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing. This is Romans 7, verse 14 through 18. For to will is present with me, but to perform the good uh, I find not. So Christ came to save men by faith who were under the law. And that's what it concludes here in verse 22 through 23. But the scripture hath concluded all are under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to all them that believe. For before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under faith, for which we should be afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, by the law was our schoolmaster. That's the purpose of the law. Our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Greek, Jew, nor Greek, nor any bond or free, or any neither male or female. You are all one in Christ. And if you be Christ, you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise of God. That is a really wonderful passage to study. And I, 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 I fear I didn't do it justice. But I'm going to tell you something that's fundamental of real Christianity. The real truth about God's dealing with sin and the sinner and his, his salvation that he offers us is by faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you for yourself and your son. I pray that this... Uh, teaching lesson here tonight a very very uh, deep subject is I pray it's illuminated some of your children here today I pray that they appreciate you the more your great wisdom your great wisdom and your dealing with sinful mankind and how perfect and pure the plan of salvation is it's without reproach it's 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 perfect it can lead to salvation we're saved by grace by faith in the person of Jesus Christ not by the law not by works of the law, not by circumcision. We're saved by faith. Faith in you and faith in your son, Jesus Christ, who fulfilled the law, was suspended between heaven and earth, shedding his blood for us and for our sin. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. I pray, Lord, that we'll have a better grip on our salvation and the great cost that it cost your son that we could be saved. Bless us now. Dismiss us with thy grace. Give us a great week for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you.